Justin Baldoni is an actor, author, TED speaker, and podcast host. He's a self-proclaimed student and truth seeker who is trying to undefine masculinity. His book and podcast of the same name, Man Enough, centers on stripping down our interpretations of masculinity. It encourages vulnerability, healing, and reminds us all, we are enough. I know I felt that during my conversation with Justin today. This is 4D with Demi Lovato. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on my podcast 4D with me, Demi Lovato. I give everyone the opportunity to introduce themselves however they want to introduce themselves. So go for it. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Justin Baldoni. <laughs> Epic name. Thank you. We'll talk about that in a second. I don't feel that way, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that from you, Demi. And <laughs> okay. I... Uh, and I am on a relentless search for the truth. Wow. That's what I got. Oh, that's so beautiful. I, that resonated really deeply with me. Mm -hmm. And that's what, honestly, this podcast is all about, is trying to find our inner truths and yeah. helping it become less taboo for other people to live their authentic lives as well. I'm very happy to have you i'm so happy to be here and i'm so it's cliche to say i'm so inspired by you because i know we hear that so much <laughs> but what you're doing is publicly on a relentless search for truth like you're never just saying okay this happened to me and let me keep it to myself or you know this is my journey and this is private you're like no i have this platform i have this fame i've been blessed with this now let me use it and it's really beautiful. And, Thank you. And I just feel like there needs to be another word for inspiring, but it's like, <laughs> it's, um, it's motivating, it's reassuring, and it's healing. Thank you. So thank you for what you're doing for so many. I mean, I could say the same about you. What you are doing to strip the norms of what people think of as masculinity. I mean, I think that what you're doing is so brave and so, it, it's also so ironic because you easily could fit into the mold <laughs> of like, cause no, I'm, I'm serious, you're a good looking dude. You could easily like be what you don't want to be. And I have been. Can we talk about that? What was Oh, we can talk about anything like? you want. Nothing's off, <laughs> cool. off limits for you. First of all, let it just be known that Demi Lovato said it was a good looking dude. So I'm just going <laughs> to so, take that. But I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> to, so. to all the people in the room who don't care, uh, <laughs> just putting that on my resume. Um, the, the, the teenage boy in me who desperately wanted to have people think he was attractive is very happy right now. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, let's talk about it. Yeah, I've been that guy. Uh, this is a shedding, I think, of that. And being really honest, there's a part of me that is still that guy and will always be because that's what socialization does. I'm going to be in a continuous process of unlearning mm. everything that I was taught it means to be a man since the time I was a kid. From my father, from my uncles, from my grandparents, from media and, and TV and film that I consume, from magazines to the schoolyard to teachers. There's There's been... There's been a collective socialization for myself and for every other young boy, especially in America, that where we're taught this is what it means to be a man. And so I've been that. Uh, my 20s was trying on all the different masks of masculinity, all the different coats of armor, hurting myself, hurting other people, hurting women, hurting the people that I loved and recognizing that I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's a zero-sum game. Everybody loses. And the deeper that I've gone in my own healing, the more I am willing to publicly shed that persona um, and and be willing to talk about stuff that I would have never been willing to talk about, um, which in many ways you're doing on a much more extreme level. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I just think that if you are a truth seeker and a truth spreader, it doesn't matter the 
amount of truth you're spreading as long as you're doing the work. Yeah. If you could rewind it for me and describe yourself as a boy in your purest form, what would that look like? Oh, okay. It's funny. So I'm doing I'm doing a lot of very deep healing work right now. Um and it's all directed towards little Justin. Mm. A lot of my book I write about little Justin and um and I god, I just and when you start doing that work, you look around and you just wish everybody could see that sweet little child that they have in there that desperately needs love and compassion. So I would describe myself as a scared, <sighs> kind, and um, emotional and sensitive boy who so desperately wanted to fit in, who just wanted to be like the other boys, who just wanted to be bigger and stronger and faster to have the girls like him, who wanted to be noticed to be funny, to be thought of as smart, um, and um, and who developed, I'm going to be getting too real here, who developed a, in many ways, a hatred for his body mm-hmm. because it wasn't enough. And he wanted it to be more. And he wanted to be what he thought the world needed him to be and um and really just wanted to be loved that was that was young justin and he didn't get it he didn't get it in the way that he needed it and um and so now i am uh i'm on a really deep healing journey as i'm publicly going through um and talking about a lot of these things i'm also privately you know, going deeper so that I can speak from a place of, of understanding and compassion. Mm. I'm a student. I'm not a teacher. Mm. I know nothing. But what I do know is the work that I have to do here to reconnect my head and my heart. And, um, yeah, that's even crazy. The deeper you go for me, I've learned that so much of my success comes from a trauma response. (laughs) Mine too. Twinsies. Twinsies, right? Trauma <laughs> yeah. twinsies. But you, when, you, when you look at that, <laughs> TTs, tattoos, yeah. right? All right, Jimmy, we'll go get tattoos. <laughs> uh, when you look at that, you start to just question everything. You're like, all of this that I have, I've built this thing, and it's mine, you know, and I, I, we shouldn't be comparing. It's very different than yours. I've never experienced anything like you've experienced. But you recognize, like, wow, my work ethic, my, my, even my search for truth, all of this is a trauma response. Yes. Now, it doesn't mean that it's bad, right? Yeah. But it's important to acknowledge so that we don't, we don't get stuck in the hamster wheel because when, one thing we know about a trauma response is that no amount of success or money or fame or influence or anything can ever satisfy or heal it. So it will never end. Well, and then you have, it, to take it a step farther, fame and success is a trauma in itself. And amplifies it. It amplifies all of it. Some people are listening to this being like, fame is a trauma. Like, what are you talking about? But you have to understand. They should watch your documentary then. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If you you watch my documentary, um, it's it's that hypervigilance when you're eating outside and you hear a shudder and you think, is that a paparazzi lens from 50 yards away? Mm. Um, or is it somebody's camera that's, that's next to me? Are they going to take a picture of me while I'm eating? And for me, that's like being in recovery from an eating disorder. That's a very vulnerable time for me is when I'm eating. I don't like to be interrupted. I don't like to be, you know, snapped while I'm eating. That's just a personal thing. It's hard enough to just eat. You don't need. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yes. It is hard enough to just eat. And, and it's that, that hypervigilance to where it's almost becomes like this underlying paranoia 
because you're just constantly thinking, okay, is someone taking a picture of me right now? Or is someone following me? Is someone... And so fame and success kind of, even though the trauma of it may not be as uh, impactful as, say, a, a big trauma um, in my life that I've had personally, like, yeah. it's not obviously the same, but it is impactful and it does impact you for a substantial amount of time, if not the rest of your life. No, I, I completely support and acknowledge that. I know for, I, I haven't had that level of it. What I can tell you on my end is, you know, growing up, I, I had a lot of kids uh, where I went to school and how I grew up in the town that we lived in, there was a lot of backbiting and gossiping and, you know, you'd look over and they'd be whispering and laughing at you and things like that. And when I experienced a small level of fame, um, that actually was what came back. It was, these people can't be looking at me because they like me. <laughs> what came back was that kid who every time somebody looked at him, it felt like he was, there was something wrong. Yes. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then of course we live in this time and age where there's no boundaries and <laughs> yeah, mouthful of food. Can I have a selfie? Oh, can I finish <laughs> eating? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my wife loves that. My wife literally like karate chops people away. It's, but, but it's nothing like what you experience and, uh, and all that to say, and we don't need to make the whole thing about fame, but the point is, is all of it. Like, I think by the time you even get to that point, I wish every, God, you tell me if you agree with this. My wife and I joke, we wish that everybody could go through a 12 step program. <laughs> like, I just wish, I just think the world would be a better place if that was schooling. Right. If that was, if that was high school, it's like, oh, got to take this, you know, it's whatever. It's just understanding. It's like you, you have hit rock bottom and you, you have an ability to be self reflective and aware. And mm -hmm. uh, I wish every celebrity had a chance to do that because they'd recognize probably that what got them to their fame more than likely came from trauma themselves. Right, right. Because that drive, I mean, that's a pretty intense drive to get to this place. Mm -hmm. it's, and then t to sustain it. There's a, yes. you know, we're not just like perfect people that are like, hey, we got our shit together. Like, huh, you know, it's, yeah. we're all, we're all running from something. Every human being on the planet is, and we all need to heal. Mental health is a lifelong journey. With Talkspace, you can match with a licensed therapist and send them unlimited messages. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a therapist in your pocket. That's why being able to reach out anytime from anywhere makes taking care of my mental health super easy. I'm more relaxed when I'm traveling, knowing if I need to talk, I can just send a message from wherever I am. Working through things in therapy can be tough, but connecting with a therapist isn't. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text, video, or send voice messages to your licensed therapist, so it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7 and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code 4D to get $100 off of your first month and show your support for the show. That's 4D and Talkspace.com. So whether it's you know, with your book, your podcast, or otherwise, how would you tell my audience what your work entails? Sure. Um, my, my book's called Man Enough, Undefining My Masculinity. In some ways, it's a response to a TED Talk I did in 2017. Wow. 2017. Uh, it was a week after my son was born. And, uh, mm -hmm. so he, and he'll be four uh, this October. Cute. Uh, I know. So four years ago. And um, it's called Undefining My Masculinity because for a long time, I recognized that there was a problem with masculinity. And I was grappling with this idea of like, but I don't, I don't feel bad for being a man. I'm not apologizing for being a man. What is the, What is it? What is this thing? What is What am I feeling? Why? Why, why do I show up different in every situation? Why do I puff out my chest around certain groups of people? Why do I act overconfident around these types of people? Why do I act insecure around these? Like, it's just, mm. I, I'm just constantly watching myself. And I'm sure 
you've done this, but we all have these moments where you like say something and in your head you're like, why the fuck did I just say that? Or yes, uh, <laughs> or you leave a situation and you're like, I that was who was that person that I was being? That wasn't me. Where did that come from? Right. And we never really trace the root of that. And I wanted to trace the root of it. And for me, it always stemmed back to, okay, it's a performance. Masculinity for me, what I've been taught is a performance. It's something that I have to earn, which means it's something that can be taken away. And so my journey has been to not redefine masculinity, because first of all, who the hell am I as a straight white cisgender dude to define anything, right? I'm at mm -hmm. the epitome of privilege, but to undefine it so that anybody who identifies as a freaking man can be allowed to be a man. We don't need a new definition. We have to get rid of it. We have to throw the box away and allow anybody who is a man to be allowed to be a man um, and not police them. And because it's just creating so much hurt, not just for the men themselves, which often isn't talked about, but for everybody in their lives, for women, for gender nonconforming folks, for trans folks. We are hurting so many people, and at the end of the day, we're also killing ourselves at four times a higher rate than women are. So we got to address these issues, and I think they bleed into every area on the planet. You can look at climate change and say, that is directly linked to our inability to process and to, and to have compassion and empathy for the world around us. You can look at mm. all of these things and, and I think it just ties back. So that's the work that I'm doing is, is undefining it and going deep and asking questions about myself, sharing stories from my life in hopes that that my vulnerability and my willingness to, to be ugly and messy um, and to get to the truth of the matter will inspire other men who might be in my position to do the same. Would you say that a part of undefining your masculinity is leaning into your femininity. I don't even know if it's leaning into it. I, I would say it's acknowledging that it's been there the entire time. Yes. <laughs> yes. And because I think the problem, the problem is this idea that we have to lean into one or the other. Right. When in reality, I believe what makes someone man enough is that they're human enough. You know, right. from, from a very early age, uh, Bell Hooks, uh, an incredible uh, feminist author, writes um, in a book called The Will to Change. Uh, she, she writes that every young boy at a certain point in his life has to engage in a psychic act of self-mutilation. She says that the first act of violence that a wow. boy commits in the patriarchy is not violence against women, it's violence against himself. And this act of psychic self-mutilation can be also called soul murder, where you are severing yourself from your feelings, from your heart. Mm -hmm. And it is through that act of soul murder that we begin this lifelong process of uh, misogyny and of disrespecting women, of having a distrust and a dislike of women and gay and gender nonconforming and trans folks because they represent what we're told is weak. And whenever you uh, raise a child and you tell them all the things they cannot be and they should not be, but those things that they can't be are individuals, they're humans, they're, they're identities. If being that thing is the worst thing on the planet, how are you ever going to expect that boy to love that thing, to accept that thing, to see that thing as a human being? So we're raising our children, our boys, saying, no, in order to be a man, I have to get rid of all of the feminine qualities, all of the things that could make me weak or get me called gay. I, ha I have to repress those things. I can't show those things. But in the process, what we're doing is we're telling that boy that those things are bad. Right. And then we wonder why we have violence in the world and, and sexual assault numbers and all of the things that I know you've talked about. It's because we're teaching our young boys, we're dehumanizing other people other genders and folks in the process while telling them that they're not allowed to be these things. When in reality, all of us are an amalgamation of masculine and feminine qualities. Yes. Every human being on the planet is. We're born with sensitivity and compassion and empathy and kindness, right? We're also born with purpose and bravery and wanting to be strong, 
but I think that the emphasis, it's always that joke, like the emphasis is on the wrong syllable. The emphasis <laughs> for us men has been on the wrong syllable and that it's not about physical bravery, physical feats of strength. It's actually about the emotional feats of strength that we need to be going in on and redefining and using those things to explore our hearts. So I don't even know if that answers your question. That was my rant. Thanks for coming I, to my second no. TED Talk. Uh, <laughs> Wait, that's actually really funny because most of the time people say that, but they haven't had a TED Talk. <laughs> so you, you saying that is actually really great. Well, appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Feel free to feel free to leave a, a like or dislike in the comments below <laughs> about my rambling. <laughs> I, I I'm incredibly fascinated by it, especially because so much of what you're saying resonates so deeply for me. You know, I came out as non-binary this last year, yeah. and as I'm Going through this journey, I'm finding that it resonates with me to be gender nonconforming as well. And, um, you know, for me, when I came to that realization, it was that I finally came to a place in my spirituality mm. that I felt balanced in both my masculine and feminine energy. Mm. And I didn't want to rob myself of my full potential by labeling myself one energy over the other. Mm. And so for me, I've begun to just describe it at just a spiritual level for people to understand because my spirituality is what drove this, I guess, lesson, this yeah. journey. Yeah. And uh, last year I started meditating in quarantine. You know, there's not a lot to do. So <laughs> I picked up meditation and changed my life yeah. 1000 percent and then I began to have these revelations on my own and and I just really I'm excited to hear you talk about the energetic levels of masculinity yeah. and femininity because it it is such a spiritual thing for for some people including myself thank you for sharing that yeah uh, <laughs> thank I, you for listening and, uh, and thank you for coming to my TED talk Listen, I'd, I'd, I'll come over and over again to your TED Talk. You need a TED Talk. I'm, if you, I haven't. I haven't done a TED Talk, but I would love to. Just wait. Okay. Well, five minutes after this gets released, you're going to get the phone calls. So, uh, cool, cool. You know, you said something really interesting. And um, what comes to mind on the spiritual side of it is I was raised in the Baha'i faith. And there's a quote in the writings that says, the soul has no sex. Yes. And it's so hard for us as human beings to place ourselves into the spiritual realm, right? Into this idea of there is no you or me. There's just us, yes. right? The, this, uh, this, this deep sense of infiniteness, uh, exalted beyond time and place. I'll just give you a little, I'll give you just two minutes on my belief on this. I, I spent the last 10 years um, in my... <laughs> In my spare time, making documentaries about individuals who have a terminal or chronic illness. It's what inspired wow. me to make um, my, my movie Five Feet Apart um, and Clouds. They're all based on real people, real friends that I had um, who have since passed away. I'm so sorry. Oh, well, it's, I was so blessed to be able to get a chance to tell their stories and to be with them. And, and one of the things that always drew me to it has been my belief in what happens when we die, which is this. We're told in the Baha'i writing specifically that... Um, if you think of this earth, of this world that we're in, think of it kind of like a womb. And in the womb, you have everything that you need, right? You have sustenance, you don't have free will, but you are at the, the will of your mother. You're getting all the food, you're encapsulated in the perfect temperature, you're floating in this orb, you're growing and you're developing things. You're developing eyes so you can see and ears so you can hear and skin to protect you from the elements and bones so that you can be strong and a heart that'll beat and pump blood through you and olfactory so that you can smell and all these things, but you have no use for them in the womb. There's no use for any of this stuff in the womb, but yet you're developing them beyond your free will, right? And while you're in the womb, you're coexisting just a few inches away in this world, Earth, a floating rock in the middle of outer space, right? <laughs> Orbiting a massive star. And just outside that womb is a blue sky and an ocean and air. And you'll have a use for all of those things that you're developing, but you don't need them now. And then one day you die of the womb and you're born into this world. And suddenly you take your breath and you needed those lungs. 
that you were developing for those 10 months. You need your eyes so that you can see. You need all of these things. What we're told is that one day we're going to die of this world, which we know, right? That's why I think we're all on this spiritual journey to try to figure out why we're here. What, what, what is the purpose of this life? And one day we won't need these physical bodies anymore. And if we believe that energy can't be created or destroyed, and we believe we have a soul, then what are we taking with us? Well, it's all of the spiritual virtues that we're spending our lives developing on this planet. The spiritual arms and legs and eyes and ears, right? Our trustworthiness and our love and our compassion and our forbearance and our resilience and, and our empathy and our patience, all of these things, right, that are only developed when you are tested. Those are the things that we're going to need where we go next. And what we're told is where we go next is as different from this world as this world is to the womb. We're not bound by space and time. We're, we're everywhere at once. We're not gendered. We're all, we're, we're beings. We're all one. We are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. And just that idea that we could be going there, that we, that there's a purpose, that there's something else that maybe our souls will always be ascending towards God can influence the way that we live if we choose to meditate on it, which is why mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting that you picked up on this energy of you not wanting to be in a box, that you're more, right? Because at the end of the day, I think all of us are. We are all mm -hmm. so much more than the box that society places on us. And, yes. and we can express that rebellion in different ways. We can express that and we can fight for that truth in different ways. And so I want to just acknowledge yours. And mine is, you know what? Yeah, I, I, I see myself as a man, but I'm more than that. Yeah. I'm more than that. And I think that the idea of the box that's placed on me as a man is hurting, I think, everybody and the world. And if we can remove that box and make room for everybody, we'll all be so much happier. The world that you're describing sounds like 4D, <laughs> not yeah. bounded by space and time. Yeah. You know, um, just people embracing their truths. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to create when I started this podcast was what is a safe environment that people can come and share their truths with me yeah. and we can get into really interesting discussions. Well, um, I hope the afterlife looks like your set because that's really <laughs> cool. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I hope it does too. <laughs> I mean, sparkles and glitter and, yes. and psychedelic lamps, uh, yes. I'm in. I'm so well, this is this is my shroom room. Ah, uh, so got it. It's it's not that I take shrooms all the time or anything like that. It's just I have a <laughs> profound respect for fungi and how could you mycelium. not? Oh mycelium. my gosh, it's it's I mean, so we, fascinating. We could just we could just like vamp out for the rest of the <laughs> podcast on that as an example. Yes. yes. I I mean there is a there is a genuine belief possibly that if we don't that like we're just going to be taken over by them because they're better than we are because we're I screwing mean, it all up. I mean we that are might screwing be, it up. That might be the thing that ends up happening. They're like, "All right, these humans are done. We're just going to take over." <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the mycelium win. Right. Mental health is a lifelong journey. With Talkspace, you can match with a licensed therapist and send them unlimited messages. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a therapist in your pocket. That's why being able to reach out anytime from anywhere makes taking care of my mental health super easy. I'm more relaxed when I'm traveling, knowing if I need to talk, I can just send a message from wherever I am. Working through things in therapy can be tough, but connecting with a therapist isn't. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text video or send voice messages to your licensed therapist, so it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7 and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code 4D to get $100 off of your first month and show your support for the show. That's 4D and Talkspace.com. Do you think that you have any limitations that are still placed on yourself by society, by the programming um, and the conditioning, even though you're doing all of this work? You know, I find that I'm ever evolving 
Yeah. Because, well, that's what this is all about. This whole life experience is about learning so that we don't have to keep learning it over and over again. Yeah. And that gets into reincarnation. But anyways, are there still limitations that you that you that you struggle with? Oh, yeah. So mm-hmm. many. Um, so many limitations. I mean, where do we start? <laughs> um, what comes to mind right now? You know, my parents are 72, 73, and um, as healthy as they are, I know they're not going to be here forever. Mm -hmm. And yet, I oftentimes find myself trapped when I'm with them because there's a part of me that's a little boy that just wants to be nurtured and loved and held and seen. But it's it clashes with adult Justin who needs to control and puff out his chest and um, and be his own man and isn't comfortable being really, really intimate and close with the people that I love the most. It's like this weird thing that happens, and I know a lot of men experience this, especially with their fathers, but it's like, it's like back in the old days, in the medieval times when we had castles, you'd have these open gates that would open and shut based on threats. Mm-hmm. And as men, we're kind of taught to go through our lives with learning how to open and close these gates. And our gates are closed most of the time. They rarely open. They open for, you know, relationships sometimes here and there. But when it comes to my family, I still feel that the guard gates shut. And and oftentimes I'm watching it happen in real time like an observer. And I'm and I can see it's like a it's like a false start. If you're listening to this, I'm moving my body back and forth. It's like I want to go and like put my head on my dad's lap. Mm-hmm. And just be a kid and have him stroke my hair like he used to. But then I don't because that's not that's not right or that's not what men do or I'm frustrated by something or my mom will say something totally normal and I'll be triggered by it and I'm annoyed. And and this is this is an example of something that I'm working through right now in real time because I'm trying to be as conscious and aware of how I'm raising my children. And, you know, one of the things I recognized was that my parents never showed weakness. My parents, I was never able to learn from my parents' mistakes. I was only able to learn after they made mistakes. And I was able to be like, myself as a judge, that was a mistake. Or why did they do that? Or there's something else going on there. And they're still together. They're very much in love. They're amazing parents. I honor, you know, my my whole TED Talk was about my father and what I learned from him and how to be sensitive from him. But at the same time, I never saw him be vulnerable with me. And there's a difference between being emotional and being vulnerable. And to this day, I struggle. We both struggle with vulnerability because he didn't teach it to me by modeling it to me. And my mom didn't either. And so that's that's one thing I'm really struggling with that I'm still working on that I'm going to therapy about. I wrote in my book um, about my first sexual experience. And I know you've talked a lot about this type of thing. And so I'm comfortable sharing. But I've been also processing my own sexual trauma um, mm-hmm. the first time, the first time I had sex, it wasn't consensual I'm and, so sorry. and thank you. And I, uh, I didn't think it was a thing because I'm a guy and, right. and every guy is expected to want sex no matter how it happens. Right. And I wasn't ready. And, uh, I found myself, uh, you know, trigger warning, but I found myself inside of her and I pushed, pushed her off me. And I was like, what the, what, what was that? And then I was kind of gaslit from that point on without realizing it and made to feel guilty for even having a feeling about it. It It's like, oh, we've already done it. And then, you know, we stayed together and then we were intimate after that. I made the choice, but I never actually looked at it. I never actually looked at that moment and thought, what did that, what what was, what did that mean to me? Right. Mm -hmm. Because deep down, I believe even when you're playing around it's all sex right it's all sex it's just different different levels of it but for me at that moment as a 20 year old boy young man it i wasn't ready and it you know in my late 30s now looking at that and holding space for the fact that like wow society told me that i wasn't allowed to have an opinion about it i couldn't go talk to a guy about that i couldn't go talk to a friend about it because if i did they would have laughed at me they're like dude you just got laid what do you what's the problem there's no space for 
being a young boy or a man who's sensitive or who wants to wait or who isn't ready. You're only allowed and expected to be a sex machine and want it at an earlier and earlier and earlier age. Um, and, uh, and so that's something that I'm also digging into and looking at, okay, well, you know, did that influence use it, my use of porn as, at a young age, you know, um, where do I go when I feel down or depressed and, and, and what's my shame look like? And, um, and there's just a lot of unpacking that I've been doing over the last year there, which is why I share it in the book. Cause most people think that, you know, that can only happen to women. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of limitations. And I think that life's always about limitations and breaking through them mm. and then looking at them and saying, oh my God, that happened to me and having compassion for that and loving yourself and, uh, and recognizing that like there's a, there's also a gift in some of these things because you yes. can use, as you've done, you can use these wounds as Rumi says, the wound is where the light enters you. Uh, you can use these things and recognize that, okay, so long as I allow myself to feel the pain and the sadness and the trauma, then I can fill that wound with light and then I can pass it on and share it. And that's really what this is all about. And I'm sure that's what you're doing too. So, I, I, I love that quote. That is absolutely how I've begun to heal is every wound that I've ever had, the light has seeped in. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like God sprinkling love instead of salt in my wounds. Yeah, that's exactly it. The Hawala says, my calamity is my providence. Outwardly, it is fire and vengeance, but inwardly, it is light and mercy. Mm. That just feels good too. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, it is really refreshing too when you can look back at a situation i was having this conversation with one of my best friends yesterday um we were on a hike we were talking about you know the person that i used to be several years ago mm. who was just stuck in playing the role of the feminine pop star that everyone wanted me to be including myself at the time i wanted so desperately to be that but not for internal reasons just for like validation seeking the trauma response reasons yes the yeah. trauma response reasons and i remember looking I, I told her yesterday i was like i'm so glad you never knew that version of me hmm. because i was in so much pain and i just it's beautiful to have relationships where they've only seen the light um from within hmm. and i do want i think it's important to highlight the hope and the faith for yeah. anybody that's out there struggling who might think that, you know, their traumas are just too difficult to get through or they're never going to be able to break out of these molds that people are putting on them. But mm. I just want to reiterate that it is possible mm -hmm. and the freedom of the life you get to live after you break through the glass ceilings that you need to break through for yourself. Yes. It's just so worth living. It's so worth every second of my heart pumping blood through my body. Yes. Preach, Demi. Yeah. <laughs> so so I just <laughs> No, I'm with you. So I wanted to It's liberation, but that's that's the word. And when I, you know, tying it back to at least my work here, it's it's liberation. It's freedom. That's yes. what it. That's what this is all about. It's we we construct prisons for ourselves here. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't believe that hell is a physical place that exists. Like when you die, I believe hell happens here. It's a state of mind. It's a state of being. And so many of us are in our self-imposed prisons, mm -hmm. and um, and it's not always our fault either. And right. so much of this work is about breaking free. It's about freedom. It's about liberation. And one of the great things about it is then once you start to break free, you can free others. Your yes. freedom, right? It's like the, the how the Buddha says that one, one candle can light thousands. Oh. That's how this works, right? Yes. And that's why what you're doing is so damn important. And I just want to honor and acknowledge you for it because you could, you could have gone a very different way Thank after you. everything you've been through. And you said, no, I want to tell the truth. 
because yeah. my truth can set other people free. And look at what you're doing. You're setting people free. And, and same goes for you. That's what life's about. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll yes. honor that. My initial response is to deflect. Deflect compliments. <laughs> Wait, that was really good. I could yeah. sense the deflection and then you yeah. stopped it. That was I'm perfect. Worried because, but there's, a, there's an example of what I'm working on in real time, which is I deflect all day long for, yeah. for self-preservation too. Because at some point I decided I, nev I never want to believe anything about me. Because, you know, mm -hmm. you get hundreds of thousands of messages and you start to believe your own, you know, your shit doesn't stink. I don't want that. I knew I didn't want right. that. So right. I, but, but what I do do is I believe the bad because that's the part of me that's a masochist and I have to work on that. So even with compliments, I've noticed I'm just a deflector. And so now I'm really yeah. trying to be like, no, okay, I, thank you. I deflect on the smallest things too. Like <laughs> my makeup artist this morning was like, wow, your lashes look so long. And I'm like, oh, it's just the last lash serum I'm using. Like, <laughs> yeah, you why can't, can't I just embrace my, my eye hairs. Because deep down, it just all comes back to this idea that like we're not quite enough yet. And and uh, tying it back to the book, like what I hope my prayer for everybody, regardless of your gender, is that you recognize your innate enoughness. Because mm. all of us are enough. We have been since the beginning. We just have to recognize it and realize it and believe it. Mm-hmm. What role do women or female identifying people, non-binary folks, what, what part do you think they play in the conversation about men and masculinity? It's two wings of a bird, right? It's, it's, we need each other. My co-host on the Man in a Podcast, Liz Plank, always says that our liberations are tied together. All of all of our liberations are tied together, right? You can't have, you can't have feminism without this other movement that happens internally with men. Like men have to embrace it as well in order for there to be equality. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're just missing each other and we're just yelling at each other and nobody's listening to what the other person is saying. So the role for me in my personal life <laughs> is probably every good thing that I've learned Everything that I've said today that maybe made some sense, if anything I said made any sense, <laughs> has come did. from my listening and learning from, honestly, 99% women and <laughs> gender nonconforming and trans folks. That's just the truth. That's beautiful. Spoken like a true feminist. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be here. I, I right. just, I, honestly, there'd be, there'd be no room. Women have broken down the gates and um, and I'm able to kind of walk through them and say like, hey, listen. <laughs> Hearing those words come out of your mouth makes me hopeful mm. that more men are going to have that same view as well. Because I think that even though I don't identify as a woman anymore, I still grew up with all of those limitations placed on me. Hearing those words come out of your mouth gives me faith in men. Um, even the ones that have hurt me. Like, mm. you don't realize how much healing you're bringing to other people, especially women or non-binary folks who can apply what, they, what you are saying to past experiences that they've had and say, wow, if this mm. is what a man looks like today, I have faith in men. It's so healing uh, even just to have this conversation with you. So mm. I, I wanna say thank you. Thank on behalf you. of my own <laughs> healing experiences. <laughs> oh, that really means, that means a lot. And um, just don't put all your faith in me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not just you. It's not just okay, you. We, you know, we, uh, we did meet I'll today. I'll fall down. I'll fall down. <laughs> I'm going to fall down. I, I will assure you that I'll fall down many times, but I will always try to get up. But um, that has been one of the sweetest things the largest percentage of buyers of my book have been women and uh, consumers of my podcast and TED Talks and things like that have been women. And it was hard for me at first because my message has always been for men. Mm -hmm. And I was like fighting it. I'm like, I can reach men here in my personal life around the world, but like what? Why aren't men diving into this? Why aren't they entering the conversation? And it was frustrating. And then I started to get responses from women. And I started to hear and listen and read them 
and hear how women like you, like what you just said, have, have been able to have a different level of compassion for the men in their lives. Yes. And, and at the end of the day, like that's what we need for each other. Mm. It's, it's, we're all suffering under, under a broken system that oppresses all of us. It might look like men are winning, but internally we're dying. Wow. We're engaging in that psychic act of self mutilation. We're committing that soul murder at such an early age and we're dying inside and we don't even know it until it's too late and hurt people hurt people. So that's what this is all about. But if hurt people hurt people, then that means healed people can heal people. And, and what I try to tell men is like, you know what? It might hurt your fragile male ego as it did mine to recognize that you're the problem. But also remember that that means you're the solution. Mm. And us men love solutions. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you do. So let's focus on that. But thank you for saying that. And um, if you're listening to this and you have a man in your life, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, please, please uh, let him know that he's enough just as he is. Because there's a whole world underneath that that uh, chainmail suit that he's wearing, um, that suit of armor that he is not exposing to anybody. And uh, and there's probably a lot of tears that need to be cried. I can't wait to make those phone calls after mm. we hang up here because it is so important. I I I don't have anyone romantically in my life today that's a man, but I have a lot of men that are in my life and are very influential and uh, and I just I can't wait to tell them that. Mm. I appreciate it. It's never a bad time to find ways to bundle your home and auto insurance and save on coverage with Policy Genius. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare home and auto insurance in one place. They can help you find home and auto coverage similar to what you have now, but at a lower price. They've saved customers an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying for home and auto insurance. Getting started is easy. First, head to policygenius.com and answer a few quick questions about yourself and your property. Then Policy Genius takes it from there. They'll compare rates from America's top insurers from Progressive to Allstate to find your lowest quotes. If they find a better rate than what you're paying now, they'll switch you over for free. Head to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. So the last question that I always ask my guests is, I, I ask them, what does 4D look like to you? But for yours, I want to specify it a little bit more. Okay. In the context of men and masculinity, what does that utopian world look like to you? It looks like a world where every human being on the planet feels free and mm. safe to be who they believe they are. Not who anybody else believes, not who society dictates, not anything. That every person on the planet has the space and the freedom and not be shamed for doing or for not doing. And that's what I think true equality and true freedom would look like, where we are thinking about what's best for another soul and living in a place that encourages all of us to just practice empathy and compassion and kindness. And when those things become as rewarded as productivity, I think that will be when we quote unquote smash this idea of whatever the patriarchy is. Wow. That's the utopian. That's, that's you. That's your, that looks nice. I'm envisioning it right now, and it looks really, really beautiful. Oh, I forgot one thing. This might be controversial. Mm -hmm. And there's no borders. <laughs> yeah. There's no us and them. There's yes. just one. It's back to that idea that we are one planet. We're a one people. We're the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. That's utopia for me. I when I came out as non-binary, I had said that gender is just another border between 
humanity and divine wisdom. Yeah. If I love you, I want you to be you. I don't need to control you. And I just think it all comes down to love. We have yes. to love ourselves enough and recognize that we are enough just as we are. And if I love you enough, then I want you to be you. And I can right. only love you enough when I love myself enough. Mm. Well, wow. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank this you. was a very, very impactful, beautiful conversation that I feel like so many people are going to be able to take away so much from. Thanks for creating such a safe space. I went we went we went pretty deep. I really I appreciate what you're doing and your intentions and your uh, radical search for truth. And I just, uh, I'm going to send you love and prayers that you continue on your way and you don't hold Thank back. Thank you. We need it. We need it. Yes. 